Good morning. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 4. I was looking to see if my wife was here, if she could tell me I could go up and preach, because she knows better than I do. So, obviously, maybe when I get as wise as Mr. Croce, I'll do better. But I did have a CT scan on Friday. I'm just waiting to hear the results. So, they didn't keep me there, so I think I'm okay. Don't you all love going to the doctor? Me neither. I, I had some fun on Tuesday. Um, so I, I ran out of my antibiotic for the infection. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And so I called an on-call doctor on Saturday who was like, well, uh, and you never want to hear that from a doctor. But he said, well, I'll, I'll order some more. And so I ordered some more and I went down here to the pharmacy to pick it up. And I think a lot of your you guys know the pharmacist, right? John, is that right? So John was there, and we started talking, and he was asking me about what my symptoms are, and I told him, and I said, I, I'm fine, and I thought I was, according to my wife. And so <laughs> then John was asking me, we were talking, and he told me, he said, well, um, I said, I'm, I'm cold a lot of time. I'm not usually cold. He said, well, that could, that could be one of the, the signs, and I thought... You, none of the doctors have told me that, though. And so one of the doctors in Denver called me, and they asked me what my symptoms were. And I said, well, I don't, what, what do you mean? Like, well, how do you, how do you feel? And I said, well, I'm fine. And she started asking more questions, and I said, well, last Monday I was just worn out from Sunday. And I said I was, you know, my, my knee was sore, and then my calf was sore. She goes, what did you say? Because I said one of the, the trigger words, I guess, and I repeated it, and she goes, okay, I'll, I'll call you back in just a minute. And so she called me back, and she said, you need to be at Delta Hospital at 3.30. And I thought, okay, well, why? And uh, she said, well, that's a sign of a blood clot. And so I get down there, and so I saw the lady to do the ultrasound, and she was doing it. And well, the, when the doctor called me, she said, Okay, the kind of test it is, they're going to do the ultrasound, I'll get the results immediately, and then I'll call you, you know, today, right after, immediately to let you know. I thought, okay, well, that's fine. And so I was in there, and she was doing the ultrasound, and everything was I, fine, I thought, and she, uh, I kind of told her what the doctor said, and she goes, okay, and she goes, well, if you have a blood clot, I won't let you leave the hospital until I talk to a doctor. Said, okay. So she got done, and she let me go home, so I thought, oh, I'll be fine. So I get home, and I'm waiting for the doctor to call me, and it was like 4, four ten maybe. So I waited, five, six, seven, never called me. I thought, huh, interesting. So I waited all day Wednesday, never got a call. Waited all day Thursday. I thought, well, maybe I should call. So I called, and then they called me back later. She goes, oh, well, I texted the, the tech, and she was supposed to tell you that you're fine. So, so I don't, you know, so I have no blood clots, praise God. I trust the CTs will come back good and will come back great. I was in there, the, the CT tech though, he knows me. He's like, why are you in here again? I said, I don't know. And he's like, well, why are you so, so happy? I said, well, what's it going to do if I complain about it? So maybe the Lord's going to give us a chance to reach out and invite him to church. So it was fun this week, but kind of. So, all right, let's get to the word. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to look primarily at verses 6 and 7, but let's read from verse 1 for the sake of context. Verse 1 says, Therefore, my beloved brother, in whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved I urge Iodia and I urge Sintiki to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. 
Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we come to your word this morning. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your word would go forth with power. I pray, Lord God, that you would use the feeble things that I attempt to say to accomplish your will for your glory and for your praise. God, I pray that you would continue to protect our church. I pray that your church, would we would be unified with one desire, and that's to live for our Savior, Jesus Christ. I ask, Lord, as we come to our text, I pray that you would give me clarity of thought and clarity of mind, and I pray, God, that you would give us all open hearts and open ears to hear your word. Father, we come to a passage that is very familiar to many people, but Lord God, I pray that we look at it anew this morning and realize that as we come to this text, these things are so hard to do. And God, I pray that as believers, we'd have a passion to become conformed to the image of our Savior because we love you. I pray, Father, that you'd be honored and glorified in all that takes place. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let me remind you where we've come from the last several weeks. In verse 1, he gives us the imperative command to stand firm in the Lord. And then verses 2 through 9, he outlines specific things that we will do if we are going to stand firm in the Lord. I submit to each one of us that this ought to be our New Year's resolution. Not really just this year, but that should be our life resolution, is to stand firm in the Lord. And we went through and we saw in verses 2 and 3 that if we're going to stand firm in the Lord, we must live in harmony with one another with believers. That is, don't allow our personality conflicts to interfere with our ultimate objective, and that is living for Jesus Christ. We saw, I think it was last week, that if we're going to stand firm in the Lord, we need to be rejoicing in the Lord. Always. I'm so glad he put that word always in there, because it's easy for me to rejoice when things are going the way that I want, and the way that I like. When I tell you that it's been a fun week, that's, I say that not, I mean, I can look back and say it's been a fun week, but in the midst of it, it's not been fun. You know, I, I spent a lot of time at the hospital. I'm getting to know all those people. When all the ad- admissions people know who I am, that's weird. And they're like, oh, hey, Jake. And I'm like, it's weird to say, hey, Jake, at a hospital, but it is what it is. But Paul tells us to rejoice always, not just when it's convenient. And then we quickly looked at last week to let your gentleness be known to all. Let your contentment with all people be known. That's hard. And then this morning, by the grace of God, we're going to see the next thing that we believers must do if we're going to stand firm in the Lord. And we come to a very familiar section. But I find it ironic that we're looking at verse 6 and 7. Where he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Who knows those verses? Yeah. Do you find it ironic that we're looking at those today? You think about our world. You think about what's going on. You know, I, I wanted to get up here. I wanted to, I wanted to sign an executive order in place in the church. And the order is no longer watching the news. <laughs> Just focus on Jesus and live for Jesus. Don't be caught up in all that's happening because the word of God is not in prison. We as believers ought not to be shut up with what's going on. Don't get distracted. 
But we're gonna, if we're going to stand firm in the Lord, I want us to examine two things. I want us to stay, take a step back and maybe look at a, kind of the bigger picture. I want us to see, one, the command to put off. And secondly, I want us to see the command to put on. Let me explain what I mean. He says in verse 6, be anxious. Anybody worry? I do. Okay, LD and I, we're the only two. All right. Let's just go out to lunch and talk, LD. Worry, is, it's easy to worry, isn't it? 2008, I finished my training in the Excel Internship. The Excel Internship is a two-year internship program where it trains people or men in excellence and leadership. It's an intense program where you go through and you work. The first year, you work right alongside the pastor. And so for me, mine was focused on ministry, had a, a youth ministry emphasis. And so what I would do is, is I would teach. And every time I would teach, I would be evaluated. And they always were very kind. They would start off and say, here's what you did well. And then here's the five pages of what you need to change. And I worked right alongside of him as far as um, how you run youth activities, from how you do the promotion and brochures and how you um, run the event, how long you do it, do you charge, how much do you charge, and do you do snacks, and do you not, and do you do a devotion, and how, how do you do every aspect of it? And I had, I had monthly assignments where I had to read the manual and I had to do book reports. I had to do a lot of scripture memory. I had to go through and memorize kind of the big idea of every book in the Bible. I had to memorize key chapters. That was the first year. And then I would go before the Excel board and I would have a mock candidating session. And the board would ask questions. They would do a hypothetical. Uh, we're a small church in Kansas. And they would say, why, why should we hire you? And they would do that for about two hours. And then year two you would um, have more responsibility. You would have to do it on your own. You would still teach, but year two, I had to run a camp from beginning to end. I had to plan it all. I had to figure out the budget. I had to figure out you know, the, um, what, how much each team would pay, where we were going to go, what we were going to do, and who was going to speak, and who was going to eat, and what were we going to eat, and how everything, every aspect. So I did that. And uh, lots of, there's a whole bunch of other stuff we did. But then we had a mock ordination where they would grill you for two hours minimum on your theology. And mine got extended to about three years, not because I was rebellious, but because I had to have at least one surgery in there and they thought it would not be wise to have me answering those questions on that medicine. And so they graciously extended mine. But I completed that training in 2008, and as of July 1st, 2008, I did not have a job. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know how to provide for my family. I was worried. I was scared. I was praying, asking God, God, what do I do? Where do I go? And as I was praying that God would provide, I still struggled with worry. I was worried about it. I was worried about providing for my family. I was sending out resumes. I was talking to churches. You know what happened? God opened up the door for me to have a youth pastor position as of July 1. And I had no break in income for my family. God knew what He was doing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm human and maybe I'm the only one, but I don't think so that worries. People are worried about the universal church. People are worried about what's going to happen in our world. You know, I found out recently that there's a couple of churches that are being fined immensely for meeting and having churches or having church on Sunday. I have a friend, a good friend of mine who's known me all my life. He's a pastor in California and he and I talk and I say, are you okay? And they're doing great. God is protecting and blessing His church, but we do worry. I do worry. 
But in our text, in verse 6, Paul tells the church, he says, Be anxious for nothing. Well, what is, what is anxiousness? Worry. That's a verb, present tense, active voice. He doesn't say it's optional, does he? But you go back to verse 1, and, and, and Paul says, he told the church, he says at the end, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. If you and I are going to stand firm in the Lord in the midst of a world that is falling apart, a country that seems to be going the wrong direction, when churches are having a challenging time to stand up, and not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, if we are going to stand firm, then we need to not worry about the future. He doesn't just say don't be anxious, but he says don't be anxious about anything. Paul tells the church at Philippi that if you are going to stand firm in the Lord, then you must not worry about anything. I could come up with pages and pages and pages and try to identify things that maybe you worry with. I could come up with pages that I worry with. But, but how, do we, how do we do, how would you do if, if I said, don't worry about your finances. Don't worry about our country. Don't worry about your health. Don't worry about your grandkids. Don't worry about anything. That's hard, isn't it? Okay, two people, yes. The Greek word for the word anxiousness is used 17 times throughout the Bible. And the reason, I, we're not going to look at all of them, but I want to, to tell you that because I want you to realize that this is important, isn't it? This hit home with me because I struggle. This is hard. But Paul says, if you're going to stand firm in the Lord, you've got to take off anxiousness. Don't worry. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. In verse 25, Jesus is talking, and he says in verse 25, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life, as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body, as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you, then not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Do you take note of how many times the word anxious was used in there? The English Standard Version says it one, two, three, four, five, six times in those verses. Jesus says that. 
just some quick observations about just in the, that, um, that passage in Matthew. Jesus himself says, don't be anxious. He commands us, don't be anxious. He gives the, ample, uh, the example of the birds. He says, if God provides for the birds, he, he'll certainly provide for you. He points out anxiousness benefits no one. Can you, can you add to your life by worrying? Nah. God takes care of the lilies. He's going to take care of his children. In verse 33, was key, wasn't it? In verse 33, he says, but, on the contrary, but, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You see, the command that, that Paul gives back in Philippians chapter, or Philippians chapter 4, the command he gives in verse 6, he says, be anxious for nothing. The point is that if we are going to stand firm in the Lord, then we ought not to worry. And when we worry, when I worry, I must call it what it is, right? It's sin. It's sin and it's wrong. The command that Paul gives to the church of Philippi when he says, be anxious for nothing, that applies to every believer. If you and I are going to stand firm in the Lord, we must lay aside, we must get rid of our anxiousness. Certainly this is not an easy thing to do. You know, maybe we struggle a little bit with the issue of anxiousness. But do you know anybody who struggles immensely with worry? It's really, really hard. This is not an easy thing to do. You can't just say, stop worrying. Oh, okay. Doesn't work like that, does it? No. Look at, look at what he says. I, I love it. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. And then he says, here's what you need to do. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So now here's the command to what you need to do. So don't do this. Get rid of the anxiousness. Get rid of the worry. Get rid of the not trusting me. He says, now here's what you got to do. But in everything, by prayer. Okay, we got to hold on there for a second. So when he says, but in everything by prayer, the idea is this is an attitude of prayer. The word but is a, is a matter of, of certainty. This is a conjunction, a logical contrast. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. Prayer is the, uh, to pray earnestly, really has the idea of a, a place of prayer. Right? So you've got to take off anxiousness, so get rid of it. Now you've got to have the attitude of, okay, instead of, instead of worrying about my family, my finances, my country, my world, my church, I'm going to go to my place of prayer, and then we're going to get to what you're going to do in your place of prayer. But you've got to have this attitude of prayer. If you notice the context of the verse, you'll see how we are told to put off the attitude of worry. Okay, get rid of it. Now Paul changes gears and he tells the church to put on the attitude of prayer. The, the term prayer as used here refers specifically to developing this attitude. This makes sense, doesn't it? If we just think about life, it doesn't just work to, to take something off. You've got to then replace it with something. And what, what Paul is saying is get rid of the, the, the uh, sin of worry and now have the attitude of prayer. When we as believers begin to worry, when I, get to, when I begin to get concerned, when I see what's happening in the world, I need to stop and have my attitude of, I'm going to go and I'm going to take it to my God. We've got to replace it with an attitude of prayer. We must have the mindset that when I start to worry, I'm going to stop and replace the worrying attitude with a prayerful attitude. 
the sovereign God, the almighty God, the creator, the king, our master, our rock, our fortress, our God. I'm going to go and I'm going to have that attitude that I'm going to go to him. And then he says, going on in verse 6, he says, okay, but in everything by prayer. And then he says, and supplication with thanksgiving. The word supplication means it's a plea, it's a request, a petition. Literally, it means to ask for something. So when we start to worry, we call it sin, we get rid of the sin, then we have the attitude of, i got to run to my God. And as I run to my place of prayer, wherever that is, you can pray anywhere, right? That's why 1 Thessalonians 5 says, pray without ceasing. You're to have that attitude. And as you have the attitude of, I'm going to take this to my God, then you're going to plead with God. You're going to make it known to Him. When we start to worry, we must immediately cast it off and then replace it with the attitude. And then you bring your plea before God, who is the sovereign one and the preeminent one. That's easy, isn't it? No, it's not. No, it's not. If it's easy for you, come tell me how you do it. Because it's a struggle. I had a guy, well, yesterday, this was neat. Yesterday morning, we met here at 10 o'clock. Y'all, this is so cool. We took a bunch of teens tubing. I didn't go. Don't panic. I didn't tube. But we took kids tubing. You know how many kids came? 12. Praise God, right? We took all these, these kids tubing, and it was so fun to see these teens tubing. And I forgot my example. I'm so sorry. Oh, brother. Paul says in, in verse 6, he says, but in everything by prayer and supplication, and I love what he then says, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Y'all, I'm not a very good pastor. I'm in my office and I have people call me. And I had one individual call me this week and we came and met and talked with me, and, and he was asking me questions, tears in his eyes, tears coming down their eyes, and, and I was, God, give me wisdom. And as I hear people pour out their hearts to me, and they, they say things, and you hear things like this. Somebody in my family has what they call suicide headaches. So why are they called suicide headaches? Because they, they said that it's called that because it hurts so bad most people kill themselves. They tell me that one of my siblings has cancer. And then they tell me my other sibling's in the hospital. And the one in the hospital just told me or just told one of the other siblings that I want to die. What am I supposed to say? Here's what I know. When I'm in that situation and I want to panic and worry, you know what I know that I got to do? I got to get the attitude of prayer. I know what we need to do. We need to go and get on our knees and pray to our God and beg our God to work in the situation for his glory. And guess what we did? We picked up a phone and we called the hospital. We, I, I asked for the, the person, the individual, the room number. And guess what? They picked up the phone. My jaw hit the ground. Uh, 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 uh. And I gave the phone to the individual. And we prayed and we read scripture. And so when we start to worry, when I start to worry, we've got to go to pray. We've got to go to God and ask God to help us to do what is right. But I love what he says, where he says, do it. Why does he say this? I've been asking myself this. Why does Paul say, with thanksgiving? Interesting. Get rid of worrying. Have the attitude of prayer. Now go and plead before God. And then he says, with thanksgiving. Paul, what are you trying to say? What do you think he means? 
Well, let me share my thoughts. I think that Paul does this because as believers in Christ, we can be thankful because our God is omniscient, right? Yes, he is. Our God is omniscient. Our God already knows what is going to be accomplished, and for that, we can be thankful, right? God knows what's going to happen in our church. God knows what's going to happen in our country. God knows the days that I have to live. God knows the days you have to live. So when we can go, the Bible says, come before the throne of grace, let your request be made known to him. He wants us to talk to him. And that's what we get to do. And we can have an attitude of thankfulness because God's will is going to be accomplished, whatever it is. We just need to pray that we'll be found faithful, no matter what happens. He says, do it with thanksgiving and let your request be made known to God. Your request, this is your, your general requests. He's reminding us of what he has previously said. Listen to this illustration. There was a seventh grade guy named Scott who transferred from a small private school to a large middle school in mid- mid-year. Could you imagine what that would have been like? For some of you, it may have been a day ago, some of you a little longer. Scott had to make numerous adjustments, and he hated every one of them. He constantly complained about having to attend the new school. His father wanted to help and encourage him, so he prayed with him every night, telling Scott not to worry, things will all work out. Scott responded, Dad, it's not that easy. It's hard not to worry. A couple of months later, his father noticed he hadn't said anything about disliking the new school. Scott, I asked, you seem more relaxed than you were a month ago. Are you still having problems adjusting to school? Scott answered, yes, I am. But I quit worrying about it. I found out that worrying was harder on me than actually going through it. Many people never learn that it's usually more draining to worry than it is to experience the thing they dread. Prayer can remove the weight of worry. Verse 7. Verse 7, he says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding or all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If we put off anxiousness, we get rid of it, we call it what it is. I've heard people tell me, and and I've been guilty of it as well, I just, I worry a lot. Worry is sin. We've got to be biblical. Worry is sin. I'm trying to be, I've tried to do that in my own life, because worry is hard for me. If we put off the sin of worry, and put on an attitude of prayer, letting our supplications be known to God with an attitude of thanksgiving because God's perfect will is going to be carried out in our lives, then we will receive the benefit in verse 7 when he says, and the peace of God. The benefit is really the freedom from worry. The idea of peace, that is the freedom from worry. This is the benefit. Does worry make you tired? Okay? Worry makes me tired. Sometimes I find myself spending way too much time worrying about it when I should be praying about it. And as we do these things, if we get rid of worry and we pray and take it to the King of kings and Lord of lords, then we have the freedom from worry because God's going to accomplish His perfect will. We just get to play a part in it. In the English Standard Version, words it this way. It says, And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
He says the peace of God, that is the freedom from worry. He says it surpasses all. It surpasses in value. It's great when we're not worrying, isn't it? It doesn't mean we just go along carelessly, but it's great knowing that our God's got it. Our God's in control, and we talk to our God about it. Those are great things. It surpasses all understanding, all comprehension, the way of thinking. And then it says it's going to guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It's going to guard, it's going to protect you. The church at Philippi is well aware of what a guard does. When he says it guards your hearts and your minds, the heart is is the inner self and the mind is your thoughts. When we do this and we take it to God, aren't you so relieved? Remember our illustration about Scott, right? Our illustration, he changed schools from a small school to a big school and it was really hard and difficult for him. But the end result that Scott came to was what? Prayer can remove the weight of worry. So what? Y'all are thinking he's going to 1145. I'm not. I knew that. Y'all are like, what already? Don't get used to it. What about you? What about me? So what? Anybody worry? Anybody struggle with worry? Okay. A couple more. LD. There's a couple with us. All right. <sighs> Remember, brothers and sisters, if we are going to stand firm in the Lord, we got to guard against worry. It is hard. We got to call worry what it is. It's sin. We've got to replace it with an attitude of prayer, letting our plea, our request be made known to God with thankfulness because God's plan can't be thwarted. God's going to accomplish his perfect will. We're just passing through. Our God is in complete control. A couple of you admitted that you struggle with worry. I'm in there as well. If you're here and you say, yeah, Jake, I do worry, I would ask you about what? Don't tell me. About what? I jotted down a couple things that we might worry about. Our country. Our church. Our president. The politicians. Our family's health. Our grandkids. Our kids. Our town. What's happening in our town. And the list goes on and on and on. I'll spare you the lengthy potential list. But if you're here and you say, you know what, I do worry. I would ask you, what steps are you going to take to get rid of worry? Or to deal with worry? Because it's, it's a real struggle. But I pray that you will be biblical as I'm trying to be biblical Because I used to just say all the time, well, I'm just a worry wart. And I'm trying to be biblical, worry is sin. And I'm trying to deal with it the way that God wants me to. And if you are there, we've got to figure out how to take it off and take it to God. And do it with thankfulness that His plan cannot be thwarted. And if you're here and you don't know Christ, you all know. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we have a big sin problem. And we need help with our sin. Our sin is sending us to hell. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you don't know Christ or unsure about your salvation, talk to me. Talk to somebody around you. Let us pray for you. Let us love you and encourage you. And if you're a believer, let us be faithful to deal with 
what we need to do to stand firm. Be careful against worry. If you do worry, talk to someone around you or talk to me. I, man, I'll be your friend. Work through it together because I do struggle with worry. I'll be honest. And let us hold each other accountable as we seek to overcome and lay aside our worry and take it to Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful that You are a God that's in control. Father, I'm so thankful that You're a God that is patient with me. You are a God that says that if we confess our sins, You are faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, You are a a God that says, I will cast it as far as the east is from the west. What an amazing God. Father, I know for myself at times, I do struggle. I do worry about what's happening in the world and what's happening in the church and what's happening in my life and our children and my children. And God, I pray that You'd forgive me. And Father, I pray for each one who knows Christ, myself included, would be faithful when we struggle with worry. We confess it as sin. And then, Lord Jesus, we run to the throne of grace to talk to You, our God, our Maker, our Lord, and our Master. God, I pray that You would help us as believers to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our toil is not in vain in the Lord. And Father, if there's one here who's never placed their faith in Jesus, may they come to understand that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Father, I know that there are so many, myself at times included, where we have such a passion for what's happening in the world and what's happening in our country. I pray, Father, that we'd have that same passion for the lost souls around us. And may you use us to proclaim the name of Christ to them. I pray, Father, that you would help us not only be hearers of the word, but God, help us to be doers, to faithfully apply these to our everyday life. I pray that you'd be honored and glorified in Christ's name. Amen.